Good morning and welcome and thank you for joining us again at our Church at Home service. It's great to have you with us. I have a few notices just to begin and then we'll worship God together. The first notice is that the new sheet is available in the usual place. Pl do please uh, pick that up, read through that. There are many important notices in there and articles. Also, um, there is a new Bible study, uh, a series introducing the book of Galatians, which is available online and you can pick that up at the same place as the sermons. And also, the third notice is that after a short illness, Ursula McCulloch went to be with the Lord on May the 9th at 10.30, surrounded by her family. Ursula was known to many people at Victoria Baptist Church and beyond for her missionary work with her husband Bernard in the Congo and for her service at Victoria in many different roles. She was a lady of great dignity and generosity, and she will be missed by very many people. Please do continue to remember to pray for her daughters, Christine, Sylvia, and Angie, and for their grandchildren. I'm going to read to you now from Psalm 100, and then we'll worship God together. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Sing praise to him and give praise to his holy name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness endures through all generations.
Our reading this morning is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 1, and I'm beginning at verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I'm not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptise if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptise with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptising. The next day... John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptising with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptise with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for agreeing to lead our prayers this morning. Before you do that, though, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. The first concerning Faye. Many people at church were praying for Faye during and before the lockdown, and it would be great if we could have an update on her situation. Yes, yeah. Uh, We met Faye yesterday, and she was very well, and she sends her, her greetings to everyone in the church. 
she, as you know, she had triple receptor negative uh, uh, breast cancer in October. She had five months of chemotherapy, and then six weeks ago, she had surgery in London. Um, since then, she's been recovering from that surgery and is feeling much stronger, emotionally much better in herself, and uh, uh, beginning again to enjoy life a little bit. She has sent a, a, a note to the church to say um, how she feels about the, the, the support that the church has given her. And she said, hey, Dad, this is what I'd like to say to the congregation. Thank you for all your prayers over the last few months, Victoria Baptist. It has meant a lot to me to know that you've been thinking of me and my family and asking God to guide us through my treatment with his love. I have never felt alone in this journey. And during the challenging parts of the chemotherapy and the surgery, I've always felt so much love and kindness from those around me and those caring for me. Thank you again for keeping me and my family in your prayers. We are full of hope for the future. Then she mentions Romans 12, 12 to finish. She says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. So that, that was a, a lovely comment from her. Uh, and we feel so enriched that her, her journey with the Lord continues, um, despite uh, the difficulties she and the family have faced over the last six months. Um, it's so... Uh, uh, encouraging for us all. Um, I know you, there are things that you would like us to um, uh, uh, pray for for, for, for for Faye and the family, uh, for Steve and for uh, uh, Neve and for James. Um, pray firstly for them and their, their emotional and physical health. Um, pray that Faye, who's due to have her radiotherapy next week, um, it's been condensed from three weeks down to one week because of the coronavirus. Um, and then following that, she goes on to further chemotherapy for um, a few months. So pray that, that she gets uh, a, a reduction in, a, in, in the side effects from, from the treatments and that she remains strong um, and that she remains free from the virus uh, over the next few weeks. Okay, then I, in, in a moment I will do that. Uh, just one and then you can pray for the church. Uh, okay. But also I'd like to ask you, um, as a doctor yourself, I'm sure lots of people at the church would be grateful just for uh, your thoughts on the current crisis. Anything you want to say to us or, or, or tell us um, well, it, it would be helpful? Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I'm retired, but I, I can look at it with some medical knowledge. And uh, it, it is a fast moving picture. But even though we have the uh, uh, reduction in the uh, limitation of what we can do during the lockdown, to be honest, I don't feel for most of us that the situation has changed. Until the vaccine is there, we are all still at risk. So those who are under 60, um, they are of a concern that if they get the infection, they can become spreaders of the infection. And for the over 60s, we are still vulnerable from it. It can be, a, we can have a difficult time with that virus. So continue to be cautious, continue to look clearly at what risks you want to take and why you're taking them. So stay safe, stay, stay firm in, in what you've done over the last eight weeks. Don't let that all go. Okay, super. Well, Stephen, if you pray for us, uh, for our church, our service, and then I'll, I'll uh, pray for you guys in faith. Right, okay. So let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the one true God, the one we can fully depend on, the constant in our lives. We thank you for sending us your son who died on the cross so we could have the hope of eternal life. From the depths of this pandemic, we bring before you, Lord, those from our church family and our local community who are anxious and depressed, those who are unwell and concerned about loved ones, those who are vulnerable because of underlying conditions, those on furlough or have lost their income streams, those who are now going back to work, those who feel more isolated and lonely than ever before, those who are bereaved and grieving for loved ones, those who are frontline NHS workers risking their lives daily. 
those working in care homes, shielding our loved ones, our students facing study and exam uncertainty, and our children who return to school in July and in June. Father, be their leader, comforter and protector. Be their strength, their shield and their resource. Be their security, their safety and close companion. We pray, Lord, for you to empower us, to rejoice in hope, mm. patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer. Amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, I want to pray for this family. Thank you for Stephen and for Helen. Thank you for Faye and to Steve and James and Naomi. And we commit them all to you and ask a great blessing would rest upon them. We pray for that these histology results that come back would be good news, Father God, and bring good news and blessing to this family. We pray regarding the forthcoming radiotherapy and chemotherapy treatments. We pray that you'd keep each one of this family free from infections and complications and other difficulties that might arise. We pray that this treatment would be completely and fully effective. We long and pray, Father God, for good health for faith. We thank you that during this time you've been working in her life through this uh, terrible thing, bringing out good things. Lord, we commit them all to you as a family and we pray for strength, for peace, for health and for joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are 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 feel that you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see that you're working Even when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working We make miracle work, promise keep Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who. Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden, his garden, a much tougher garden, and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go into the void, not knowing whither he went. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. While God said to Abraham, now I know you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we, at the foot of the cross, can say to God, now we know that you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Jesus is the true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who is at the right hand of the king and forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job. He's the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. <laughs> is that a type? See, that's not typology, that's an instinct. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life. Who didn't just say, if I perish, I perish, says, when I perish, I'll perish for them to save my people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so we could be brought in. He's, he's the real Passover lamb. He's, 
He is the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible's not about you. This morning, we're continuing our series, The Incomparable Jesus. We haven't quite got yet to the statements Jesus makes about himself, but God willing, we will next time. This morning, I want to look at you with this amazing passage about John the Baptist, because it gives us a perfect introduction into the ministry of Jesus and its impact for all of us. I don't know if you have seen the controversial film, Joker. Please don't take this as a recommendation. It's a disturbing and violent film. It's about a character called Arthur Fleck, who's an afflicted, misunderstood victim of serial abuse. It's painful to watch one abusive encounter after another. All the time, his frustration and rage are building until at last he breaks and out it comes in a violent, brutal attack on one of his abusers. Then, instead of feeling regret, he begins to feel powerful and he's reborn, born again as Joker. And then he begins to dance. One of the most Pivotal and memorable scenes of the film is him dancing down the steps uh, between two streets in New York, like a butterfly escaping from a chrysalis. Finally, he's free and he's expressing his joy in dance. He's born again, a whole new person. It's an interesting commentary on our culture, a culture which says... That the way to be free, the way to dance, is to express what's on the inside. Be yourself. If you want to wear clothes that other people find strange, then you wear them. If you want to behave in ways of which other people disapprove, then you behave that way. Because who are they to tell you what to do? In modern culture, the way to receive the approval of the people that matter is to express yourself. Now, that's a significant break from what people did in the past. And it's a, tra- and it's a significant break from uh, traditional cultures in our world today. In traditional cultures, the way you receive approval from the people that matter is not through self-expression, but by self-denial for the good of the community. For men in the past, that was often found in military service, so that you suppressed your inner coward for the good of the community. To have come through battle or to have been wounded in battle were the way to honour. You denied yourself for the good of others. For women, it was predominantly through childbirth. You suppressed your own fear of pain and danger for the good of a community. Being a mother was what made people in traditional cultures dance. It was the way to honour. Now, understanding that helps us understand the world in which we live. Because we're not only, uh, modern culture is not only different from our uh, ancestors, it's also different from people who live in traditional cultures today. One of the ways we see that manifested most clearly is in religion, or attitudes to religion. A person from a modern culture who expresses themselves, if they have religious doubts, they express those doubts and they act upon them. Whereas a person from a traditional culture experiencing religious doubts suppresses those doubts for the good of the community. So that in in modern Western culture, individual freedom of expression is a higher priority than the cohesion of the community. Whereas in traditional cultures in the world today, 
Cohesion of the community is a higher priority than individual expression. And you can see that those two are mutually incompatible. And what's happening in our world is that the internet and global communications are forcing those two cultures into a collision with one another. And that is uncomfortable for, for everybody. So which is right? What does the Bible say? Uh, which, which is to be preferred? Modern culture, the, the, to um, put freedom first, individual freedom first, or traditional culture, which puts the good of the community first? I think many people will suspect that the Bible favors the latter because the Bible was written in a traditional culture. But that would be a mistake because though the Bible was written in a traditional culture, it's not the expression of that culture. The Bible's the word of God which speaks to all cultures. And what the Bible tells us is that the place human beings find their true freedom, the thing that makes them dance, is neither self-expression nor self-denial but it's found somewhere else entirely. And this passage shows us where. And I want to show you that by looking at three things. Firstly, the signpost. Secondly, the witness. And thirdly, the one. The signpost, the witness, and the one. The signpost, the Old Testament is the signpost. It is a book that points on almost every page to its own need for fulfillment. The Old Testament is like a bride waiting for a bridegroom. It is like a pregnant mother waiting to give birth, like a signpost that demands a destination. Here is a signpost that demands a wedding. If this signpost, I hope you can see it clearly, if this signpost belongs to Lily and Jacob's wedding day, it makes perfect sense and is very helpful. But if there is no Lily and Jacob, and if there is no wedding day, then this signpost makes no sense and has no purpose. That's what the Old Testament is like. At the time of Jesus, people reading the Jewish scriptures saw them as a signpost to wonderful things to come. Signpost to a coming king. The signpost to Elijah returning in power. The signpost to a prophet who would teach God's people as Moses had done. At the time of Jesus and John the Baptist, expectations were high that the promises of the Jewish scriptures were about to be fulfilled. Firstly, the promise of a coming king, a true king. One of the most striking is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God is speaking to King David through Nathan the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's the promise of a king who will come and establish an eternal kingdom. Psalm 89 is another. It says, He will call out to me, You are my father, my God, the rock, my saviour. I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. And then there's a quartet of promises of a coming king in the book of Isaiah, a Promises and words that are familiar to many of us. The Jewish Bible is like a signpost promising a coming king. But not only a coming king, it promises the return of Elijah. 
See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And, and in addition to those promises, God's promise to Moses of one who would speak the words of God to his people as Moses had. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Like the signpost points to a wedding, the Old Testament is a signpost on every page that points us to Jesus. Jesus not only fulfills over 40 Old Testament prophecies, as the video showed us, he is the fulfillment of one Bible storyline after another. To refuse to see Jesus as the one the Bible points to is like refusing to believe this signpost points to a wedding. So the Old Testament is a signpost to Jesus. John the Baptist is the witness. John the Baptist's ministry was marked by both enormous popularity and being beyond the jurisdiction of the establishment. Today, the equivalent of that would be to being on YouTube, to being a sensation on YouTube. Imagine someone on YouTube announcing a new thing that God was about to do and attracting a huge following. Imagine everyday people uh, connecting to see the latest thing that John the Baptist was saying and doing. Yeah, people from churches, people from synagogues and mosques, people from universities, all being attracted to this figure on YouTube. What would happen is that the political leaders, the religious leaders, and the establishment would become nervous. And they'd want to know who he was and with what authority he spoke. And that's what you see happening in this passage uh, when the religious leaders from Jerusalem send out people to speak to John and ask him who he is. So, so they come to him and they, their first question is implied. They, Are you the Christ? He, it says in the passage, he did not fail to confess, but freely confessed. I am not the Christ. Then who are you? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? No. He answered, no. I think you can sense their frustration. The next line, it says, then, then who are you? Tell us so that we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John said, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. I am the one who comes before the king and says, Behold, the king is coming. Make way for the king. Move those things out of the way. Clear the path. The king is here. The king is coming. And John, who doesn't say much about himself in this passage, has a lot to say to us about Jesus. And I want to show you three things that he says to us about the one. The first thing he says is, Jesus is easily missed. He says, among you stands one you do not know, in verse 27. He said, I myself did not know him, in verse 31. And he said, I would not have known him, except God revealed him to me, in verse 33. I think when John is telling us that Jesus is easily missed, it's an allusion to the story of the prophet Samuel going to anoint King David as king. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 16. God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem and there to anoint one of his sons as king. Now Jesse had eight sons and when Samuel saw the eldest, Eliab, he said to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But God spoke to him and said, the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And having looked at all seven of the sons that Jesse had brought to him, Samuel said, are these all the sons you have? And Jesse says, 
Well, there is still one more. There is still the youngest, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. So he sent for him and had him brought in. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. The least likely, by human judgment, is the one that God chose. There was nothing in David's appearance that would cause anyone to recognize him as God's chosen king. And as it was with David, so it was with Jesus. Despite the fact that in Jesus all God's promises to Israel were being fulfilled, they were unable to recognize him. In fact, a recurring theme in John's gospel is not just the inability of people to recognize Jesus, but the refusal to judge his claims fairly. Those who ought to have recognized him first were not only unable to do so, but often they were unwilling to do so. Now, isn't that true about our own society? When you think about our society, it's not just that our society is is unable to recognize Jesus. It's also unwilling to consider the claims of Jesus fairly. How many people can say that they have considered the claims of Jesus fairly? And how many would say they simply preferred not to do so? The first thing John tells us is that Jesus is easily missed. The second thing he tells us is that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one. What that means is that Jesus is the one who will make us clean. And Jesus is the one who will make us dance. At this time of lockdown, many people are doing DIY jobs. And I want you to imagine that you've been painting something, or perhaps varnishing something, and you come to the cut time when you want to clean the brushes, and all you have to clean them is in is cold water. You could spend an awful long time trying to clean a paintbrush of oil-based paint using just cold water. You need something else. You need white Spirit. John baptized with water, and his baptism couldn't wash sins away any more than water gets oil based paint or varnish off a paintbrush. You need an entirely different kind of baptism, and Jesus is the one who will give it to you. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit. There is nothing so sticky, nothing so dark, nothing so hard set that the Holy Spirit can't make it clean. When John tells us that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit, it means that Jesus is the one who will make us clean forever. Jesus is the, and Jesus is the one who will make us dance The next chapter of this book begins with one of Jesus' most famous miracles, turning the water into wine. Maybe you're watching this this morning, and for you, you feel that your wine has run out. Perhaps it's you're struggling with anger or rage or shame or guilt. You can't wash them away. Nobody else can wash them away, but Jesus can wash them away. He's the one. He can make you clean, and he will if you come. And then lastly, John tells us how. Jesus is the Lamb. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As far as we know, Though expectations at this time were rife about the promises of God being fulfilled, no one was talking about the Lamb of God. Which is strange because the Lamb of God is right there, front and center, in some of the most important stories in Israel's history. When Abraham 
and Isaac climbed Mount Moriah together. And Isaac said to him, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, God himself will provide the lamb. And when they got to the top of the mountain and it looked like Isaac would be sacrificed, God provided a lamb and the lamb was substituted. The lamb took Isaac's place. And when that happened, Abraham said, about the place, the Lord will provide. Later, in Israel's history, when the greatest and most terrible plague was about to fall on Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, Each man is to take a lamb for his family. Take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the doorframe. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and will bring judgment. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you. It was the blood of the Lamb that protected God's people. And thirdly, the prophet Isaiah, speaking about a servant king to come, said, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. All of those lambs are signposts to Jesus. He hadn't come to kill Israel's enemies as a conquering king, but as a servant king to be killed by them, that in his death, he might bear the penalty for every single sin of his people. That his death might, as the Lamb of God, he might be their substitute. He might be their protector. And by his wounds, they might be healed. He would set them free from the fear of judgment by bearing that judgment on their behalf in their place. For those with eyes to see, Jesus has done everything necessary to make his people safe forever. The Bible is the signpost. John the Baptist is the witness. And Jesus is the one, the true prophet, the true king, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world. What will make us dance? Not the self-expression of modern culture, nor the self-denial of traditional culture, but simply Jesus, the one who gave himself for us, the one who gives the spirit who will make us clean, the one who turns our water into wine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have done more for us than we could ever have imagined and more for us than we could have asked for. Open our eyes to see our need for Jesus and Jesus as the perfect answer for our need. Grant each one of us the grace and peace that Jesus brings and grant that he might receive through us the glory and honour due his name. Amen.
We've come now to the end of our service. Thank you for joining us this morning. I want to close the service now with these, uh, these words. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you all.